Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live session today. I will be going over a quick starter presentation just before we begin to welcome you all and introduce you to our program and the various opportunities we offer if you have, of course, not previously attended any of our uh, shadowing sessions. Um, I do want to highlight that Pale Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic status, abilities, or location. My name is Jesus. I am the Chief of Program Planning here at PHS, and I want to thank you all for attending today. Now let's get started. Um, just a little PSA. We do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate all students. This setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you need any assistance enabling the transcript, please direct message one of our team members. Those are the ones with the um, little blue background like mine. We are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure our sessions are accessible to everyone. So please, if you have any recommendations whatsoever for how we can improve, you can definitely email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. If you want to stay in the loop, follow us on social media. We are active on both Instagram and TikTok, or you can also sign up for our email um, list on our website to never miss a session. So since this is an international program, I want to know where are you guys Zooming from today? You can drop it in the chat just to let us know. I'll be looking at it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you guys so much. We have people from all over. Okay. Oh, we have people from Canada as well. Okay, so we have people from the US and outside of the US. Thank you guys so much for sharing. I myself am calling from the wonderful island of Puerto Rico. Um, so we do have some opportunities for you, all as benefits of being part of our program. And if you were, by any chance, looking to get research experience, I am excited to announce that pre Shadowing is launching a research program that will allow students to connect with principal investigators as they conduct research in a plethora of topics, fields, and locations. This program is, of course, 100% remote, which means you have the power to connect with absolutely anyone. Um, for more information, you can fill out the interest form that was sent in the chat below, and we will get back to you as soon as possible with any additional details. Um, we have also partnered with Kaplan to get our students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products, as well as free resources such as study guides to help you prepare for your standardized tests like the MCAT, the NCLEX, or the PCAT. Um, if you fill out our short sur survey in the chat, we will get you signing, signed up for these deals for free. Um, and I would also like to draw your attention to another amazing program. That amazing program is Neolith. Neolith is, is an online mental health platform for students, for pre-health professionals especially, we know that the path isn't easy, so that is why we have partnered with Neolith to spread the word and offer free access to the services if you use the link in the chat or enter the code PREHEALTH when signing up. Um, this, for the month of July, pre Shadowing is excited to announce that we are hosting a bingo board social media event where you will be able to fill up a bingo board with each board having a specified dollar amount. To participate, all you need to do is post this on your social media platforms and get a group of friends to help you fill up the board. Check out the blog post for more details. So visit our Instagram to get more details about it. No, I'm sorry about this. I'm gonna mute myself. I am very sorry for the interruption, everyone. Um, let's get back to it. Okay, so additionally, we have also partnered up with Krispy Kreme for you all to purchase one dozen donuts to enjoy with your loved ones. With a donation of $10, you'll be able to receive your treat while also helping us here at PHS. Uh, more information and instructions can be found by clicking the link that was sent in the chat 
or accessing our website. Lastly, it is the perfect time to exercise outdoors with Freehill Shadowing's new Pledge Drive event. For this event, you will essentially be able to work out and help raise money for an excellent and healthy cause. Um, for every $5 that are donated to you, you will be required to exercise for one hour. Um, for more information, please also visit our website underneath the blog section. Another amazing organization is Mask for Mask, which is also um, women-led, and it donates four masks for every four masks sold. These go to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, those in the homeless community, healthcare workers with other proper PPE, and others who are struggling to stay safe. Um, with our discount code PHS15, you can get 15% off your order. And if you buy through this method, Freehill Shattering will also get 10% of the proceeds, which is amazing because, as I mentioned earlier, we are a nonprofit that runs solely off of the support of our community. If by any chance you want to play a bigger uh, part in supporting PHS, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be part of our administrative team and lead students in various projects and initiatives with professional outreach, grant writing, and a lot more. We do understand that as a pre-health student, you may not have the time. So we also offer the opportunity to volunteer asynchronously with tasks that can be done on your own time. We would definitely love to have you be part of this program and contribute your own unique perspective. So I want to invite you all to apply. Um, wonderful news, if you are a high school student, we want um, and want to get involved, we have started a program called HTP, which stands for High School Training for PHS, which allows you to connect with college pre-health programs, get involved in fundraising for PHS, and organize resources for other high school students that are interested in medicine through pre-health showering. Also here at PHS, we want to recognize the hard work of all of our students in the program. So if you are interested in getting published, you can submit essays, reflections, research papers, and reviews to our editor-in-chief through the link dropped in the chat to have your work on our website. This will definitely look great on CVs, applications, resumes, etc. So do take advantage of it. Part of our mission here at PHS is to promote diversity. And in order to do this, we have launched an initiative to have monthly panels to celebrate different demographics in the field of medicine. Some of these upcoming events include a series on patient experiences, a COVID-19 roundtable, and international student forum. If you have a mentor, professor, or professional that has inspired you in any way, and you think they could contribute to these conversations, nominate them today using the link in the chat. Also, um, if you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our program. As you know, pre-health shuttering is completely student run and we are working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everyone. Unfortunately, Zoom and our website are not free. So any contribution you can give would be greatly appreciated. If you are not financially able, we request you send this link to someone you think can, so we can continue to support those who cannot afford similar opportunities. Throughout this session, I invite you all to drop any questions you may have for the speaker in the chat. Our team members will be making note of these to be asked in the latter half of the session, that being the Q&A session. Um, and I also want to encourage you all to take really good notes as a professional is going over their presentation, as there will be the chance to take a post-shadowing assessment to verify your virtual shadowing hours. More information will be available on this at the end of the session, so stay tuned. Um, and lastly, if you can, we request you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation, as we are respectful of different circumstances but it does help us feel closer together in a time when social distancing is mandatory. Um, we also request that you make sure to mute yourself as this will ensure the professional has the complete and full attention from the audience. Um, 
Once again, I appreciate you all for listening. And now I would like to welcome our professional, Dr. Rao. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. You may share your screen whenever you are ready. Okay. Mm, just a... oh, okay. Launch meeting with them. Okay. Audio going with. Audio mute. Okay. Hi, is the screen being shared? Yes. yes, we can see them. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm just dumb at this stuff. Okay. Hope you understand. Well, um, as they said, I'm Dr. Shri Kadaparao. I am a board certified otorhinolaryngologist from Hyderabad, India. And why is the screen not moving? Okay, so today in my presentation, I'll be uh, uh, talking about the introduction to otorhinolaryngology and my path to otorhinolaryngology and a brief on the clinical anatomy of your ear. And I'll make you walk through along with me about how to diagnose and manage certain clinical scenarios which are pertaining to the ear. Well, otorhinolaryngology is a surgical subspeciality in medicine that deals with the surgical and medical management of ear, nose, throat, head and neck, and hence we simply call it as uh, ENT branch, which mainly deals with ear, nose and throat and also the structures which are related to head and neck. So what does an ENT specialist treat? Most of the common people think that this ENT is all about wax and you know nasal mucus, but actually an ENT surgeon can provide diagnosis and treatment in several areas of expertise, which include otology or the neurotology, which I am completely subspecialized into, mainly which deal with the diseases of the ear, like ear discharge, swimmer's ear, hearing loss, which are ranging from a newborn baby to an elderly individual. And of course, tinnitus, the constant ringing in the sounds. And also neurotology is a branch which deals with the dizziness and balance problems. It also deals with the rhinology, which deal with the disease of nose and the paranasal sinuses like sinusitis, nasal bleed, some uh, you know loss of smell, which is usually seen in this recent uh, apocalyptic situation, the COVID scenario, the laryngology, which deal with the disorders of the throat, including voice and swallowing problems, head and neck, which deal with both the cancerous as well as non-cancerous tumors, which are involved in the head and neck, including the thyroid, parathyroid-like cancers, or uh, pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid lungs, thyroglossal cyst, and many more. And the booming branch, the facial plastics and reconstructive surgery, which deal with mainly rhinoplasty, uh, deviated nasal septum, cleft lip, cleft palate, etc. And of course, uh, surgeons who do not want to really operate, they can just become an allergy specialist uh, where they deal with uh, uh, the medical management and of course immunotherapy or the allergy shots in conditions like seasonal and perennial allergic rhinitis, hay fever, etc. Well, this is a slide which uh, is regarding my path to otorhinolaryngology. I feel this is important for you because uh, I'm from India 
this is a bit about me. I hail from India and our medical system is a bit different from uh, that of US and UK. In India, we get into med school after giving our national entrance examination. I did my med school from uh, Andhra Pradesh and uh, this is uh, for about four and a half years. And I passed out in distinction and was awarded a gold medal by the then chief minister of our state, who is uh, equivalent to the governor of your states. Later, I completed my one year compulsory rotational internship from uh, once again, Andhra Pradesh, uh, where we'll be posted in, uh, you know, different medical and surgical branches. Then I cleared my national entrance examination once again for post-graduation, and I opted for otorhinolaryngology or simply ENT in uh, Pratima Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, it's uh, once again in Telangana, it's a different state right now. So I cleared my exit exam there uh, after this three years course of post-graduation, where I stood as university topper once again in my state. Then I did my senior residency in ENT and head and neck surgery for about one year in government court ENT hospital, a state-run tertiary ENT hospital in Hyderabad. Then once again, I did my fellowship in cochlear implant surgery for about six months at uh, Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai. Currently, I have my private practice. I'm the director and consultant ENT head and neck surgeon at Dr. Rao's ENT Group of Hospitals, Hyderabad, India. Well, a good thing or the lucky thing for me is that I practice along with my husband and my father-in-law also, uh, who are ENT surgeons. Well, Today in my presentation, I'll be discussing the cases mostly which are related to otology. So it's nothing but dealing with the ear, which I'm completely subspecialized in. Before I go into the case presentations, uh, let me talk to you about how a normal hearing works or a normal anatomy of the ear. Our ear is divided into three parts. I think the cursor is there, yes. Uh, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Outer ear consists of the pinna and uh, uh, external artery canal. The middle ear comprises of three tiny bones, the malleus, incus, and the stapes. And stapes, which is the smallest bone in our body. And inner ear comprises of the cochlea and the vestibular apparatus. So a bit about the physiology of hearing. Sound enters the outer ear canal as shown, and this causes vibrations of the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. Then this sound must travel through the middle ear space into the nearby middle ear bones, the malleus, which is highlighted, the incus, the second bone, and the stapes, once again, the smallest bone of our ear. This tapis will transmit the sound into the cochlea or the hearing organ, the engine of our ear. Inside the cochlea, these sound impulses are converted into electrical impulses by the tiny hair cells. And these are, con these are transferred to the brain through the auditory nerve. And this is processed in the auditory cortex of our brain. So basically, the mechanical energy, which is, uh, you know, by the transmission of the sound is converted into electrical impulses by the tiny hair cells which are present in the cochlea. And hence, this is considered as the sense organ or the engine of our ear. If any of the links in this chain from the external ear to the inner ear are disrupted, you'll be left with hearing loss. So with this brief introduction, let us go into the case presentation proper. Case scenario one. So I would like to make this quite interactive. So I have a couple of questions also popped up for you guys so that you could just, you know, reply me. Uh, I'll be popping up the questions in between and please try to answer them. Okay, this is the first case scenario. A 25-year-old female presented to us with complaints of left ear pain. 
Her pain started since three days. It was sudden in onset and it was progressively worsening. Her ear pain aggravated on chewing, drinking water, or even talking, and even opening her mouth. So this pain relieved temporarily on taking pain medication. And now, you know, taking a detailed history is really important in order to arrive at a probable diagnosis. That's what I feel as a surgeon. Uh, before even proceeding to the examination and investigations, you know, because most of the times, half of the diagnosis will be understood just with the uh, history itself. Now, once again, coming back to this patient, uh, this patient had a history of upper respiratory tract infection a week ago and she had no history of similar episodes in the past and there was no history of trauma or ear discharge fever or giddiness and she did not give any significant past medical and surgical history so uh, we started with our routine ear nose and throat examination and yeah this is me in my opd room and the one who is sitting opposite to me is not a true patient she is my pa and she just volunteered there you know, to just be a practice patient. I place this video in particular here in order to make you feel that you're truly shadowing an ENT surgeon and hope this helps. And yeah, this is how we do a physical examination. We put on all our gadgets, so headlight and start our examination. So first, when a patient complains with the ear problem, we examine the ear pinna and of course the surrounding area needs to be checked for any fistulas or sinuses or any scars. And then we do a proper nasal examination and this is how we do a nasal examination. That's the Thuricum's nasal speculum, which is held in the left hand of mine. And we examine the interior of the nasal cavity. Also, when a patient complains with ear problem, yes, we check all ear, nose, and throat together. And we also check for the paranasal sinus tenderness. There I'm checking for the maxillary sinuses, which are present beneath the eyes, and a pair of sinuses which are present in between the eyes are the ethmoids right now, which I'm checking. So I also check the frontal, which are placed above the eyes. So this patient denies any history of uh, sinus issues, and she didn't have any... Uh, sinus tenderness and on examination also. For in-depth examination, we shift to the endoscopy, endoscopic examination, and here I'm performing an autoendoscopy. We examine the external auditory canal and also the eardrum or the tympanic membrane of an individual. And this is how we examine the stuff. And that's the eardrum which is seen. So this is how a autoendoscopy of a normal patient looks like. This is the right-sided. Uh, just the second wise. This is the right-sided eardrum, and uh, this is the left-sided tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Well, in our situation. Uh, this is the autoendoscopic picture of the right eardrum, which is normal, and uh, this is of the left eardrum. Okay, there is a mismatch. That's okay. But what do you think has happened to our eardrum? I would expect your, the answers from here on. How to check the chat? All right, students, you can uh, give your answer in the chat. Okay, I'll give you a clue. You could see that this patient's eardrum is completely bulge as if the pus is under tension with a surrounding zone of hyperemia. You could see leash of blood vessels over here. And this condition is known as, because this is the first case scenario, I'm just letting out the answer. This is known as acute suppurative otitis media. We call it acute because the time duration is very less. She had recent onset of infection. And this is suppuration you could see in the middle ear. So otitis is uh, ear and media is the middle ear. So this is how the diagnosis goes on. It's a suppuration which is happening 
in the year. Oh, some of you have been answering. Sorry, I just missed that. Okay, how do we deal this with this uh, scenario? As you know, this condition is known as uh, acute suppurative otitis media. We usually manage it medically. We give them uh, oral antibiotics because there is a lot of suppuration going on. If we do not give this, your drum may burst out and the entire pus may ooze into the ear into the ear canal. So we start off immediately with the oral antibiotics and, and a couple of uh, decongestants, both oral and topical. Usually we give the nasal decongestants. And then we also give uh, mucolytics so that the entire pus or the phlegm which is present over there is broken off and it liquefies and comes off through the nose. Yes, it's not from the ear, from the nose via the eustachian tube. And of course, a uh, few pain medications in order to relieve your pain, relieve the patient's pain. And we ask the patient to review after 10 days by when she must have uh, completely recovered. Okay, moving on to differential diagnosis. Um, you know, with differential diagnosis is something like when the patients have uh, more or less similar complaints, but the diagnosis will be different. So the patient will be presenting to us with the similar pain in the ear and on looking at the autoendoscopic picture, it is different. So I'm popping out certain scenarios in that way. You could just, uh, you know, answer that stuff. Okay, what do you think uh, this is? You can happily, this is a spotter, you could simply give the answer. It's very easy. Yes, I got the answers. Burst, rupture of the ear rum. Yeah. Yes, the answer is true. This is uh, what do we call a traumatic perforation. The perforation of the hole in the eardrum. See, I have placed a normal looking eardrum here so that you can compare with the diseased one. And this is the ruptured or the perforated eardrum. And this is a trauma, a traumatic perforation because you could see fresh blood staining, uh, which is there. So this is one of my patients. Uh, uh, this is because of a slap injury and uh, patients usually present with uh, severe ear pain, some ear block and ringing sounds too. This is because, you know, the ossicles, these are the tiny bones. There is a, a trauma which has happened to the ossicles also. So that's the reason they have this ringing sounds also. Okay. The next one. So this is more or less the similar situation. Uh, this is uh, once again trauma to the external artery canal. This is one of my patients. She had um, she and her husband both were traveling in a bike, and there was an accident. And immediately there was lots of blood staining happening in the eardrum. She lost her consciousness, but on the examination on the CT scan, all her ossicles were perfectly intact, uh, and she had uh, just trauma over the external auditory canal. So even these patients present to us with sudden, uh, you know, extreme severe pain and some amount of temporary hearing loss and some amount of blood stain. So even this should be cross-checked when a patient complains with ear bar. And now, what do you think this is? This is, you know, uh, the most common condition what people come with. Okay, I'll give you options here. I know this is a bit tough. I'll give you options here. A, it could be boil or furuncle. B, it is just a button in the ear. Oh, oh God. Most of you are just telling me that it's a button in the ear. So here there are lots of hairs and these are the hair follicles. This is an infection of the hair follicle actually. This is not a button. This is a boil or a furuncle. It's called otitis externa and 
this usually has extreme excruciating ear pain especially when they open their mouth when because of the movement of the jaw also they have excruciating ear pain so the minute patient complains i have severe pain doc i'm unable to even open my mouth or jaw unable to have it could be because of acute suppurative otitis media or it could be because of the boil or furuncle you should actually take a screenshot of this because this is the most common thing which uh, is seen uh, you know in the ent practice well with that being said i'm proceeding with the other differential diagnosis what do you think this is i know this is a bit messy but yeah this is also one of the good differential diagnosis okay i'll once again give you the options it, is it a otomycosis or the fungal infection of the ear or is it because of ear wax or cerumen in the ear Oh, very good. Most of you are just opting for A. That's true. This condition is otomycosis or the fungal infection in the ear. See, you could see these are the black spores and these are the hyphae. It's because of the moisture which is created because of there is a small perforation or hole in the ear drum there is some discharge which is happening and this moisture building up in the ear is causing a lot of fungal infection in the external artery canal and this is known as otomycosis and once again this is also the most common presentation people present to us okay i know this is a bit difficult thing this is mostly for the postgraduates uh, this condition is known as granulations within the ear rum. So I'm not even giving options. I'm not even expecting this from you. When there is chronic suppurative otitis media, when there is chronic infection of the middle ear, it keeps on discharging from the ear. Finally, people land up with this polypoidal granulations in the ear. So uh, this condition is known as meningitis with granulations. Okay, when this uh, condition uh, patients do have pain in the ear. So these are the couple of uh, differential diagnoses for ear pain. With that being said, I'm proceeding with the case scenario two. Okay. Uh, a 27-year-old male presented to us with complaints of right ear discharge. The right ear discharge, patient had this right ear discharge on and off since a couple of years. And it was in serious and onset. It was progressively worsening and it is aggravated with the, after any kind of upper respiratory tract infections, like any cold, uh, et cetera. And the ear discharge relieved temporarily on taking some topical ear medications. The ear discharge was also associated with hearing loss. And this hearing loss was also progressively worsening day by day. And on the negative history, the patient did not have any ear pain. As like the first case scenario, there is no ear pain. There is no trauma. There is no fever. And there is no giddiness. Uh, the patient did not uh, ha mention about any past uh, medical or uh, surgical history. On the clinical ENT examination, like how I did in the previous thing, the ear pain, pinna and the surrounding area appeared normal nose examination was also normal there was no sinus tenderness and the oral cavity oropharynx was normal head and neck examination was perfectly fine and now this is the auto endoscopy picture of the of my patient in the case scenario two uh on the right ear you could see a mucopurulent discharge this is the discharge and on suction clearance there was a clear uh, you know, the endoscopic picture was more or less like this. And on the left ear was perfectly normal. What do you think is this condition? And how do you evaluate or how do you proceed? Patient doesn't have any pain. He just have some uh, ear discharge and hearing loss. 
Regarding the ear discharge, we went ahead and examined the endoscopic picture and we could find out that there is a hole in the eardrum. And this condition is known as chronic suppurative otitis media with a perforation. So this is the diagnosis. There is a perforation from which the discharge has been happening. And now we need to check about the hearing loss of this individual also, for which we go ahead and perform certain clinical tests of the hearing. We usually don't wear this amount of protective gear, but this COVID situation, I'm wearing all that respirator mask and all that other stuff. And that's once again me. And these are the clinical tests of hearing what we do. The Rennie test and the Weber's test, the gold standard test for diagnosis of hearing. I'm not going in detail into this because this is too much for you. Uh, and because this is just an orientation class, just know that we usually perform the clinical tests of hearing in the OPD itself with the help of a 512 hertz tuning fork. This is mainly done in order to differentiate between a conductive hearing loss or a patient has a sensory neural hearing loss. That is the hearing loss which is pertaining to the external ear or the middle ear is the conductive hearing loss. And the hearing loss which is regarding the nerve related issue is the sensory neural hearing loss. Once the clinical evaluation is completed, so the first is what I am doing. This is how a, a Rennie test, how is it performed? This is the tuning fork, which is placed in front of the ear. And we check whether air conduction is better than the bone conduction. And the second is what I'm doing here is uh, the Rennie te Weber's test where we do, uh, we place a tuning fork in the center of your forehead and check which side it is radiating to. And after this clinical evaluation, we send the patient for audiological, complete audiological and radiological evaluation. Audiological evaluation, which will be done by a certified audiologist. And uh, this is how we proceed with uh, the pure tone, the audiological evaluation. This is done by, as I said, uh, by a certified audiologist. And this is our setup uh, at our center. The audiologist is performing on my practice patient. So this is once again, I'm showing you all this because this is entirely a shadowing session. This pure tone audiometry is mainly done in order to check the type of hearing loss and of course the degree, the amount of hearing loss your patient has. In this pure tone audiometry, the pure tones are presented to each ear individually for your patient at different frequencies. And that's my audiologist, Mr. Charan. And uh, we, uh, air conduction and bone conductions are checked separately and the patient is asked to lift their hand whenever they perceive sound. And depending on that, they plot a graph and we obtain a proper graph uh, ascertaining to the bone conduction and the air conduction. And this is once again an important audiological evaluation. This test is known as an impedance audiometry. This is completely an objective test and especially it is useful in children. It's of utmost importance in children because this is an objective. They need not raise their hands because they do not cooperate for the audiological evaluation. This test mainly helps us uh, to find out the compliance the, or the stiffness of the tympanic membrane, the ossicular system, the middle ear apparatus in total. And this is how we do it. Uh, our audiologist, he places a, a snugly fitting probe into your uh, ear and finally you just uh, get a graph that way. Okay. So these are, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, close my patient's details. Okay. So this, this is how we proceed. This is how you obtain graphs. And this is the impedance of a uh, patient where uh, the there is no complaints of the eardrum because there is a perforation within the eardrum. And as I said, we once again proceed with the radiological evaluation. And this HRCT temporal bone, or the radiological evaluation for the ear, we call it as a temporal bone evaluation. It is mainly done uh, in order to identify the ossicular chain that is a tiny bones within the 
ear which is mainly responsible for your hearing and also to know the extent of the disease within the mastoid bone this is mainly useful in order to know the diagnosis and also simultaneously ruling out uh, you know differential diagnosis and also it provides uh, useful information about the possible challenges we may face uh, uh, during the surgical procedure which i'll be showing now such as uh, the overhanging facial nerve or a high riding jugular bulb i know this is too much for you guys but yeah just remember that this helps out you know planning the surgery prior uh, uh, to the surgical procedure itself. And now, you know the diagnosis, it's a chronic suppurative otitis media with the proper perforation and a mastoiditis with amount of uh, hearing loss. So how do you manage a case? This case cannot be just managed by using an medications or antibiotics or just topical ear drops. In that way, we could just manage it very temporarily. The permanent procedure would directly be going ahead with the surgical procedure where we drill off the mastoid bone and uh, do a proper tympanoplasty. So this uh, procedure is known as a cortical mastoidectomy with the tympanoplasty. And of course, for the hearing loss, we also do an ossicular reconstruction, what is called an ossicular plasty. And this is me in my OR performing the surgery on our patient. And patient lies in the supine position and the Surgery is usually performed under local anesthesia, and uh, this will be done under microscope. And only the part which is being operated uh, will be numb with injections. That is what uh, uh, is called a local anesthesia. Okay. After the local anesthesia is given, I give an incision post orally behind the ear. And then with the help, that's a cautery in my right hand, I elevate the flaps and that's a temporalis fascia, which is present over here. It is, uh, the consistency will be just like your eardrum. Then the deceased bone will be entirely drilled. That's a mastoid bone, which is being entirely drilled off. The entire disease within the mastoid bone is mainly drilled. And now after this, drilling procedure you'll you'll be able to see the eardrum that's a perforation which is present in your eardrum then the graft which is uh, taken earlier this is the graft which was taken which is harvested here the temporal is fascia is gently tucked i just kept it under you know speed mode so that we could fasten it up and that is stuck that is one of your bone the first bone malleus and this is the final picture you can see the entire perforation which was earlier there it, it is being entirely closed and finally i apply sutures okay so now that's that was a little blood please do not mind about it and now uh, a couple of differential diagnoses once again from here it will be even more interesting for you uh, people may present with some amount of discharge and more or less with the same complaints. So what do you think this is? Okay, this is a very simple thing. I do not want to wait, waste time here. Uh, this is a medium sized perforation, a central perforation once again, when this, uh, you know, it's a bigger perforation when compared to the previous one, as simple as that. And now, what do you think this is? Once again, you could see a large perforation within the eardrum. And uh, you could also see the ossicles, the malleus, the first bone, the incus, the second bone, and also the third bone, which are completely exposed. So this patient has a quite severe degree of hearing loss when compared to the previous patient. So this is called a bigger perforation, a total perforation, in fact. Okay. So now this is once again a simple thing. Uh, this is one uh, called meningitis where you could see some, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it just went off because I'm running out of time. It's already 11.15. Okay, that's just meningitis. And coming to the case scenario three. Uh, a 30-year-old female presented to us with... Uh, uh, complaints of uh, mosquito sounds in the ear. 
and she wanted me to remove it. And on examination, I mean, on the history, on taking a history, she was complaining that uh, she was uh, noticing this a few days back. It was in CDS and onset. And it was also associated with some amount of block in the ear. And uh, she had such history of similar episodes in the past. Imagine mosquito sounds, mosquito flying sounds, and also previous episodes in the past. Uh, this is, as I said, it's an interesting case actually. And there is no history of ear pain or trauma or fever or giddiness in this patient. And there is no uh, significant past medical or surgical history in this scenario. On endoscopic examination, this was how it appeared. Well, I kept the video once again on loop mode so that you guys could appreciate what's happening. Can I just expect any answers from you? I know this is a bit tough, but it's, it's good. see you can see the fluid which is present in the middle ear uh, it's just moving and also there are a couple of air bubbles which are present there even they are moving okay so uh, it's very common for adults to complain of uh, you know this uh, ringing sounds or ear block or mosquitoes flying in the ear um, when they have this sort of uh, fluid within the middle ear. And this condition is known as glue ear. Oh, some of you have been answering tinnitus. Yeah. This condition is known as uh, glue ear, which is very commonly seen in kids also. And we call this as, uh, from the medical terminology, we call it as effusion, otitis media, with effusion where otitis is within the ear, media is within the middle ear and effusion is some part, some fluid collection which is happening in that space. It really took some convincing on my part uh, to make the patient understand that there were no mosquitoes or any flies in her ear, you know? And this was the audiological evaluation. The patient has had conductive hearing loss and she had impedance were flat. And the diagnosis, as I told you earlier, uh, this is known as uh, otitis media or otitis media with effusion or glue ear. And how do we manage this situation? We do a mirroring otomy. So just think about it. There is some glue which is getting collected over there. We first find out the etiology, whether there is something which is happening from the nose, which where the infection is spreading into the ear, but it's as such not an infection. It's just a glue which is getting collected. So the option what we are left with to remove the glue, whichever is present in the ear. So what do we do? We give a nick, we do a small perforation in the eardrum and we remove all the glue. All right, as simple as that. So that is what I did here. We managed this case surgically and I placed a grommet there after giving a proper uh, incision in the ear drum. And that's the VT or the ventilating tube or the grommet which is placed in the ear drum after sucking out all the contents um, of the fluid within the middle ear. Okay. So once again, this is a different case scenario. This is the endoscopic video of the patient who was complaining that uh, she was having some hearing loss and also she was able to hear some heartbeat in her ear. You know, what do you think this condition is? Well, this is a spotter for you. I know this is disgusting, full of pus and other stuff, but this is how medicine is, right? just pop out come out with the answers whatever you think okay organs are pushing the ear um Oh, I got a question regarding this. Uh, when you remove the grommet, 
uh, I'll be answering it later. You, we, this grommet it usually falls off uh, over three months period. If it doesn't fall off even after six months, then with the help of a surgical procedure itself, we just remove it. It just takes a few seconds you know, to remove the grommet. Okay, coming to this situation, this condition once again is known as uh, acute suppurative otitis media, the first set clinical scenario which I've shown you. And uh, uh, with some pulsatile discharge, I'm sorry, I just went back, yeah. With some clear pulsatile discharge, that's the pus which is oozing out with the small perforation which is already there. Uh, and yeah, it is coming out with every heartbeat. That's the reason the patient was complaining some heartbeats in her sound, in her ear. Okay. So this is one more cute, interesting case. Uh, just tell me what's happening here. I expect answers at least for this. This is a very straight situation. You can see a little tiny creature. Yeah, I'll just play this, play this stuff once again for you. Yes, it's a bug. True, it's a bug within the ear. And it's asking me, just save me. You know, I'm just stuck here. I just help me come out from this situation. And this is how we remove with the help of an endoscope, auto endoscope. Just hold it carefully. See, more importance will be given to the eardrum rather than the insect, okay? So just hold it and remove that stuff. All right. Uh, uh, these are the you know, different presentations of the glue ear or otitis media with effusion. So you can see different types of glue formations within the middle ear and they, you know, diff they take different shapes. They are very emotive and some of them, they have this heart shape also. They express some love. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what are the other differential diagnoses for this glue ear? Please try to guess these, uh, most of the conditions you'll be knowing. Of course, I'll be giving you options also. So this is the first scenario. What do you think this condition would be? There's a white patch over the eardrum. This is a clue. And I've sh already shown you how a grommet appears like a ventilating tube in the previous case scenario. So the only option what we are left with is, yeah, most of you have answered it. Very happy for that. The answer is tympanosclerosis. So this is a condition where the your tympanic membrane gets sclerosed because of the chalky deposits which are happening. It could be because of a trauma happened earlier or because of extreme calcium deposits which are happening over the uh, eardrum. This causes stiffening of the eardrum and causes some amount of, you know, block in the ear or some amount of hearing loss also. So it mimics a bit of glue ear. Okay, so what's this? This is once again a pretty straight one. I've given you options also. Yes, most of you know the answer. The answer is cerumen or wax, which is entirely blocking the ear canal. So this is once again, a nice uh, thing. What's happening here? These are the options. Yeah, once again, most of you are giving the answers. The answer is osteoma. See, once when you find this kind of foreign body situation in the ear, we need to first palpate the condition. We ENT surgeons first check the consistency. If it is bone, is this a bony heart or cystic? In this situation, it was bony heart. So I concluded it to be an osteoma. It was a clear cut osteoma. I had to drill off that stuff. But I've also given a similar situation in the previous scenario where the patients have extreme ear pain. 
a furuncle or boil which occurs over the area where there are lots of hair or hair follicles so the consistency will be very soft and patients do complain extreme pain and this is more or less a painless condition but they have some amount of block in the ear and some hearing loss also so checking the consistency is really really very important when you see this kind of situations sometimes even the brain which is present above your ear may also herniate that way so uh, this is the thing which you need to know and uh, hrct temporal bone really helps out in this situations okay with that being said and this is once again a cute one what do you think is this Did I get the answers? Yeah. Okay. Most of you have been giving the answer as A and the answer is true. It's a polyp which is arising from the middle ear. It's not a berry, definitely. It's a polyp. A polyp is a growth, abnormal growth, uh, an organized granulation tissue which is popping out from the middle ear indicating c there is something which is happening which is wrong with my middle ear just have a look man at my ear all right so these patients also have some amount of block in the ear okay coming to the case scenario four uh this is the last uh, case uh, scenario for this uh, presentation a 35 year old female presented to our hospital with complaints of hearing loss. Now, elaborating about this hearing loss, this uh, hearing loss is as insidious in onset. It's, uh, it was gradually progressive over a period of three years and um, there is no history of trauma or viral infections. There is no history of ear discharge, ear pain, giddiness or uh, tinnitus in her ear. Patient is uh, not a known case of diabetes, hypertension, and does not suffer with any thyroid-related problem. Here, I want to stress about the family history. Uh, mother had that similar problem for which she has been using hearing aids. You know, hearing aids for hearing loss. This is something which needs to be noted down. Okay. On autoendoscopy, both the tympanic membranes, the right and the left ear, tympanic membranes the ear arms were absolutely normal as shown and this is the pure tone audiometry the audiological graphs of our patient so we can notice that the green arrows whichever i have pointed they are there is a significant you know they denominate the air conduction i know i didn't go in deep with the audiological because an audiologist will be better explaining about this stuff but uh, I just wanted to make sure to know about this scenario uh, because it's really very interesting and very important also. And uh, uh, the bone conductions are marked in the red arrows. And here you could see that there is a very clear sharp dip in the bone conduction at around 2000 hertz, 2 kilohertz. And this is a very characteristic a feature of a condition called autosclerosis and this notch is known as Karhat's notch. Just looking at this audiological uh, report, most of our END surgeons will understand that this patient is going through a situation called autosclerosis where the patient is having hearing loss that too particularly a conductive hearing loss. So just make a note about the, um, you know, uh, the audiological pattern, which is shown over here. And this is the impedance pattern. You could see it's an AS type of graph. That is, the graph was, uh, it's not rising. The compliance is entirely stiff. Ideally, this has to raise until to the level of one, but it is just stuck there because there is a significant stiffening. So this is called AS type of graph in both the ears. And on radiological evaluation, what do we call it as a HRCT, high resonance computed tomography of the temporal bone? 
it's suggestive or it's it was a su suggestive of an autosclerotic focus which is present in the anterior part of the oval window you could see the tiny tiny bone which is present here this is the stapes which i'll be showing in my next surgical video this is the smallest bone in your body and here you could see some autosclerosis the stiffening the extreme more amount of uh, bony deposition which is happening over there making it not to move limiting the mobility of uh, this this tiny stapes well what actually happens in autosclerosis this is very important that's why i just wanted to make sure that you would understand this Autosclerosis is mainly a disease of the otic capsule, the bony capsule which is surrounding the inner ear, where the remodeled bone, you know, this remodeled bone, whichever is present there, the white thing which is popped up, uh, it starts developing around this stapes foot plate, which connects to the cochlea. And this impedes the movement of this tiny weeny bone, the stapes, the smallest bone in our body and thus prevents the normal conduction of sound from the outer ear canal into the inner ear because there is no mobility of the stapes. So this autosclerosis situation, it typically results in a conductive hearing loss because there is a conductive mechanism which is impaired and sound cannot be conducted from the external or the outer ear to the inner ear. And the diagnosis, as I mentioned earlier this is known as autosclerosis and we do a surgical procedure actually in order to uh, you know where we remove the bone which is being fixed and once again we replace it with a piston which is completely freely mobile and this is known as this procedure is known as a small fenestra stepidotomy and a prosthesis placement of course the patient is a uh, uh, informed about the usage of hearing aid also as an alternative surge alter, as an alternative to the surgical procedure but mostly patients do opt for a surgical procedure because it's an awarding thing for an otologist and also the patients need not wear a hearing aid of course there is some medical management but it's definitely not useful it's uh, it's outdated completely Okay, the surgical procedure is completely explained to the patient, the potential benefits and the risks are completely explained. And once the patient opts for surgery, all the necessary precautions are taken, the pre-surgical checklist, investigations are done and the patient is scheduled for a surgical procedure. We do this uh, under a local anesthesia and that's me performing uh, the surgical procedure. We give a local anesthesia. That's the first step to be given. We numb the ear uh, by giving an anesthesia from behind and later this is the first step that's the speculum which is placed within the ear and that's the knife the rosen's knife we give an incision and we elevate the flap and this is how we elevate the flap that's a cotton ball which is placed and we are now able to see the middle ear. That's the middle ear after elevating the flap. And can you just tell me here uh, the structure, whichever I, I'm just popping out now. See that string-like structure, what's happening there? Okay, once again, I kept that. Okay, that's a cauda tympani nerve. No, not that's not the eardrum and that's not the vessel. That's the cauda. It's a nerve. Cauda tympani nerve is a branch of the facial nerve, and this nerve it supplies the taste sensation to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. That's why after the surgical procedure, patients do complain of altered sensation in the in their tongue because we manipulate this structure the cauda tympani this at this site at this step so that uh, we could access the middle ear structures okay now the next step is curating the posterior uh, part of the bone uh, so that the structures the important structures are exposed what are the important structures we need to watch for here so 
there will be a facial nerve, the nerve which is responsible for your movements of the eye, for, the, for your smile, everything. That's the facial nerve for all the muscles of the facial expression. The stapes, the foot plate of the stapes, is tiny, tiny bone in your body. And of course, the incus. Okay. So I didn't show you the structure. So this is the incus. And this is a drill, a skater drill, which is mainly used to make a hole or a fenestra into the foot plate of the stapes into your, the tiniest bone of your body and that's how we make a fenestra and you know what is the size of the fenestra which i'm making there any guess rough guess about the size of the fenestra size of the hole i just want you to take a guess Yes, it's definitely less than a centimeter. 5 mm? No. That is a completely magnified view. I'm seeing under a microscope. It's not even, and I'm also giving a clue that that's the tiniest bone in your body. Some are mentioning as end of a pin. Yes. No, it's definitely not micrometers. Okay. The size of the fenestra, what we are making is about 0.4 to 0.6 millimeter. It's less than a millimeter of size. In, we initially make a size of 0.4 and slowly we widen that up. Okay, that's the size of the fenestra. Why are, that's the reason for an otologist, your hand should be extremely stable during the step. Any kind of movement or at least a sneeze, whenever you, if you have any reflex also, you finally land up, you know, you may hit this, uh, the incas and patient directly lands up with sensory neural hearing loss and lifelong the patient will be complaining of hearing loss and of course tinnitus too there'll be the facial nerve uh which just lies about this and patient lands with the facial palsy and if this drills even more further deep this patient lands up with extreme giddiness on the table itself nausea vomitings and this lasts for about lifelong maybe so this is an award-winning surgery for an otologist but extremely stable hands are required for the surgical procedure okay that's the size of the perforation which is made the hole you're able to see two holes actually this is the fenestra which is made and this is the round window uh, this is a naturally made window. Uh, it will be there for everyone. This is the foot plate of the stapes and this is the hole or the fenestra which is done by me. Okay, after this, with the help of a measuring rod, uh, I measure the distance from the fenestra to the incus. That's how we measure and this roughly measures about 0 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters and finally, a piston will be placed into the fenestra and then will be crimped to the incus. That's the incus. Okay, that will be that's the incus. It is just crimped. And you could see an alligator forceps, which is you know crimping the eye of the piston to make sure that it stays there lifelong. Well. So after this, we have made a fenestra, we have placed a new piston. And finally, what we do? The step is, which was not mobile initially, now that is being fractured. And then that is being removed. That's the tiniest bone in our body. That's the bone. It was not mobile, it was useless. So we just removed that. At the end, finally, after placing the piston, after crimping everything, we seal it with an adipose tissue, which is harvested from the back. Very tiny incision will be given and that will be sealed entirely in order to avoid that perilymph 
which is or the CSF, we call it as leaking or oozing into the middle ear. And finally, we reposition the flap. That's the eardrum, which is being you know, elevated earlier and that's the repositioning which is being done. This is usually considered as, as I told you, a magic surgery notology because it hardly takes 20 minutes to half an hour for the entire surgical procedure. And if done, the patient will be able to hear on table correctly or over a period of one week because there'll be lots of gel foam which is placed there. Though That's the pieces of gel foam which are soaked in antibiotic. And those will be placed there and entirely sealed so that patient may not have any kind of infections. And uh, uh, this is how we restore the hearing loss and we are restoring one of the senses of the patient. With that being said, this is the end of my presentation. I am basically a cochlear implant surgeon, mostly into restoring the hearing of you know, many wonderful patients. You could see the tiny, mini little ones uh, hope uh, this helped you guys at least understand a bit about ENT, especially otology. Uh, uh, those are my Instagram credentials and you can anytime mail me if you have any questions or queries regarding the surgical procedure or any, anything regarding ENT. Well, thank you so much, doctor. Um, we definitely enjoyed this presentation very much. At least I know I did, and I definitely learned a lot. Um, so would you mind starting with the Q&A session? Yeah, happily. Okay, great. Um, so the first question we have over here in the chat, that was the last question asked, is how is the pistol placed securely? Okay, I've, I've specifically mentioned this. Um, Securely in the sense, the there'll be an eye for the piston. If you just check, it will be this way and your incus will be this way, the long process of incus. So first we make sure that the piston goes there inside, sits into the fenestra which we made and slowly crimp it to the long process of incus. Of course, that's an extraordinary question which, uh, which is asked by someone I do not know. Uh, this is usually asked for all the postgraduates who are present in the ENT. There are several complications when you do not, you know, uh, crimp this properly, when you do not secure this properly. Just if the person sneezes, if the patient sneezes, this may come out. Or if you crimp it too much, there is a chance that there will be an avascular necrosis of the bone when it is crimped too much, too tightly. So this comes with, you know, that that is where a skill of an otologist is being shot. The number of surgeries you do, you operate, you come to know. Uh, and, you know, this piston, whichever we are placing, it has a recoil capacity. So it goes and exactly snugly fits over there. That comes with experience, as I told you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so another question that we have over here is actually from the first few cases that you mentioned, where the sure, um, woman burst um, or had a damage in her ear, and they asked, do you suture a ruptured in eardrum or how do you repair it? The first situation was ASOM, what I mentioned, acute suppurative otitis media. That is what you are asking about the second one where there is a perforation in the eardrum or oh, the rupture in the eardrum. Yes. Um, the where, uh, where, the woman, where the woman fell from the bike accident. Yes. Bike accident. Or, okay. There are two scenarios which I mentioned. The first one is the traumatic perforation. Traumatic perforations heals they heal excellently. We do not go ahead with any kind of surgical procedure uh, because there is there will be rich vascular supply. The only thing what we need to make sure that it is not infected because once it starts getting infected, uh, you know, the edges of the perforation, they do not heal and it leads into a per per permanent perforation. And the second most important what we need to check for in that particular lady is to check her hearing status because even the, uh, you know, one of the bone was damaged in her situation, 
I got her hearing evaluation done. I know it was very painful, but in spite of which we got her hearing evaluation and also the CT scan, as I've shown you earlier, the HRCT temporal bone, where it showed there was a damage of the ossicle, but the patient was hesitant to undergo surgery for the hearing reconstruction because she was already in a state of depression. We gave her some time and the, the whole the entire thing, it, you know, it just got closed, but the hearing loss is still persistent in her situation. And the second one, uh, the external artery canal trauma, I did nothing for her by God's grace, even surprisingly her ossicles were perfectly intact. The trauma, whichever happened was in the, within the external artery canal, if you see the roof, the roof of the external artery canal, the superior part of the external artery canal was damaged for which she had this concussion kind of injury and uh, she had mild uh, dizziness and uh, you know some amount of tinnitus for a couple of days. We, I just gave her some, uh, some um, vasodilators, peripheral vasodilators uh, like beta histine or uh, uh, and of course ginkgo biloba pyracetam, that's all and some autoprotective drugs for about three months and I forgot posting the image after three months. She's doing excellent. I did not Thing for her. Nothing was uh, actually required for her. See, whenever there is rich, adequate blood supply, it heals on, it, on its own. Once it starts infecting, there is so much thing that we need to do. I kept my second case where I had to close the eardrum. That is what we do if the perforation doesn't seal off. Hope that answered the question. Wow, thank you. That's really, really interesting. Um, so another question we have over here is, um, how did you know that ENT was for you from all the other fields of medicine? <laughs> well, uh, I am basically, uh, see my parents were also doctors. Uh, my mom, she is um, OBG, she's in OBG, obstetrics and gynecology. And I didn't have much time to spend with her, but I was from first very much fascinated with the surgical procedure. See, I had this from first itself in my mind, I should become a doctor and that too, I want a surgical branch, but I do not want to burn my entire time just sitting uh, in the surgical procedure and dealing with the emergencies like how my mom did and not having any time for my kids or my family. So I made sure that I want a branch which is interactive so that I could interact with the patients and at the same time it should be a surgical branch where I could see blood every day if you see my Instagram I post I even I did I did a thyroid surgery and an ear surgery today I post every day I'm so much fascinated with the surgical procedures so these two are to be met and most important thing is a family if women are watching this I feel you need to make this work life, uh, you know, balance uh, to be happening or else at the end of the day, you just get burnt. You feel a lot of stress on you. You, you just leave your job in the middle and you don't you feel like concentrating. So make sure that all these things are satisfied. So the only options which I was left with is uh, ophthalmology, where we deal with the eye surgical procedure where there are not much of emergencies and of course ENT. And finally, I was fascinated with this ENT because it's all about the senses. And you know, the options in this ENT or the otorhinolaryngology are vast. You could just subspecialize in this otology like how I did, or also you could do a general practice. And if you do not want to go ahead and perform surgeries, if you're not interested in blood or surgeries, you can actually become an allergy specialist or a plain autoneurologist who deals with giddiness, balance, etc. So taking all these things into consideration, I finally felt like, and as I said, I am fortunate enough that even my husband and my father-in-law are also into ENT. So obviously, uh, yeah, this is a much emerging branch and you have lots and lots of gadgets to work on, as I've shown you, drill, what not, lasers, uh, cochlear implants. Uh, and most important thing is, see, you have, uh, you could see a lot of babies, uh, you know, when a baby born deaf and mute is what brought you, suddenly you put an implant on your baby and the baby starts hearing the 
parents, the, the happiness on their faces is immense. And that's what I liked, restoring the senses. So uh, that's the most important thing uh, I would like to stress that ENT is more about. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so another question we have over here. Um, how do you safely remove earwax at home? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I feel like most people don't know, don't know how to. Wow, that's from Malik Hussein. Okay. Uh, I do not want to answer this uh, question actually because we I already always emphasize that please do not remove uh, earwax at your home do not use earbuds in fact even on the earbuds if you turn it uh, it will be written this is only for the external not into the middle ear i actually wanted to post one more uh, probably in the next uh, of my webinar i'll just post a uh, picture of the earbud where a patient was talking on the mobile with one hand and with the other hand he was just cleaning with the earbud and suddenly he instead of throwing this this side he just puts this this side it's a reflex right finally the earbud went inside it just got the cotton just got stuck he had immense giddiness he was brought to our emergency department so we always ask not to use earbuds in fact do not remove this wax this wax it is in fact extremely protective for you it has a particular ph and it does not allow any kind of insects especially i have posted a video there it does not allow any kind of insects because of the ph which is secretion of course is a very good lubricant so that it's like a waxy coating over the leaves how we see so if we just put a drop of water also it completely comes out in the same way this ear wax as a acts as a lubricant in 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 case if you have severe itching or severe wax which is getting accumulated like this especially in this covid situations where you are unable to meet us directly you could just take some olive oil drops and just uh, you know very sterile ones just boil that and once again apply two or three drops into your ear only that much do not use this h2o2 or do not put some water into ears and clean your stuff and no usage of earbuds at all and extremely no no for the scandal wax treatment which i have been seeing in this uh, tiktok or other social media and big no no for that Okay. okay. I will, <laughs> very important. We all should, you know, take care of our ear health and be safe around. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, another question regarding how to use things safely is how do you use your headphones safely? Yes. I believe this is a very important question because a lot of us use headphones on the daily. So how do we use them safely? Yes, yes. This is once again an important question. See, all this uh, new generation individuals, of course, even my kid, there is a lot of online stuff which is happening because of this COVID situation. And we are forced to use, knowingly or unknowingly, this earphones or headset. And we have seen a sudden increase in the number of people who are coming with this sensory neural hearing loss. I have, in fact, a topic a webinar for all the doctors on this especially this headphones and the sudden sensory neural hearing loss which is happening especially with the elderly not elderly middle-aged individuals and gen z students like you who are you know the new generation individuals always follow this rule do not use any kind of earplugs or deep-seated you know the headset which are going into the ear in case if you are using them make sure that you're using it only for 60 minutes and not exceeding 60 percent of the volume it's a 60 60 rule what we mentioned 60 percent of the volume of your uh, on your mobile phones only should be used and not more than 60 minutes if you maintain this you are you know your ears are good and if the patients, if you feel any kind of tinnitus, any ringing sounds on the ear or any kind of fullness in the ear, make sure that you're visiting your ENT surgeon or your audiologist or there are several apps which are there to check your hearing. Um, make sure that you check your hearing because we are going through a lot of stuff right now. And that's how uh, we are emphasizing uh, for 
even for the online consultation individuals. And one more little thing which I wanted to tell, because most of you are aspiring doctors, this could help you out. Common people cannot understand this. You could do this humming test with yourself. Do something like, mm, like this. And whenever you feel that the sound is radiating towards both your ears, it indicates that your both the ears are functioning normally. When one of the ear is blocked, you can just check this way also. When you block your ear and you do this mm kind of sound, it just radiates to one side, indicating there is a block. So you just keep checking this. If you have some sort of, uh, you know, uh, problem regarding the ear. If anything goes wrong, if you feel that it is just re referring to one side, then go ahead and get your audiological testing done and do not simply if you are using a headset or headphone just follow this rule 60 60 rule only that much i love that thank you so much this is definitely very useful to a lot of us yes yes and you could understand also because common people do not understand this but because you are aspiring doctors, as I mentioned, you can clearly understand this and you can just implement this yourself and also for your family members too. Oh yeah, definitely. Thank you again so much. Um, so for our last question, this one is regarding one of our of your instruments used in the cases. So what was the purpose of the crimping to the incus? That's what uh, I mentioned you without any crimping to anything. How do you think that the piston just stays over there? You know, you are removing the bone. There are only three bones, the malleus, the first bone, the second bone is the incus and the third bone is your stapes, the smallest bone. The stapes is completely fixed. The upper part, the suprastructure, we call it as that is being uh, fractured, down fractured, and that is being removed. The only option we are left with is to crimp it to the second bone, to the incus, or to the first bone, to the malleus. Malleus is attached to the eardrum. That's why we elevated the flap and that malleus will be attached there. The second bone incus exactly lies per perpendicularly like this. And the piston, the eye of the piston has to go and crimp it. Or else how do you think that this moves? When the eardrum moves, even this is supposed to move. This piston is supposed to move, right? So for that moment, we make sure that the first bone and the second bone are connected. And that can be assumed in the HRCT temporal bone. And of course, we check that. And after that, we crimp it to the second bone because it is mobile. And whenever the first and second bone moves, the third one, the piston artificial one, which we placed here, this also moves. So it's like articulating it to the incus. That's why we crimp it there. Okay. That's really a nice question. I didn't expect this sort of questions from you, but I'm very happy that you are participating in this. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah. for our final question that was Please asked, go ahead. Um, in the chat, is, is there any comfort felt by the patient, discomfort, I'm sorry, uh, mm -hmm. felt by the patient when there is a piston? Obviously. So initially, when we place that, patient suddenly tends to move because you know, the inner ear, we are directly actually placing that into the inner ear. We are, we are placing a hole in the stapes in the third bone. So that third bone, as I shown you earlier in the clinical anatomy, it is connected to the inner ear. So we are placing an artificial thing into the, almost into the inner ear. So we should make sure that the length is not too much, that it is disturbing and causing some sort of dizziness for your patient. So as as soon as you place, there will be some sort of discomfort, like the patient may have some cough or he may land up with dizziness. That's why we ask our anesthetist to give a short, uh, a shot of uh, steroid medication so that there is uh, no inflammation which is going on. And uh, yeah, only that much. After that, the patient starts hearing pretty much normal. He starts to listen our voice. That's why I told you this is a magic surgery. And in, you know, the unskilled individuals and in the beginners, when they do it, they definitely land up with extreme giddiness on the table itself. Patient, they do jump 
uh, you know, and they have this vomiting also. That's the only thing uh, what we expect. And we don't allow beginners to, you know, drill in the initial surgeries itself because once only the stable hands are situated, that is when we give hands on for them. Okay, um, okay. Wonderful. and once again, thank you so much for answering our audience's questions. I'm going to share my screen real quick over here to begin with our wrap up presentation and get end to this wonderful session today. So once again, thank you so much for this informative presentation, Dr. Um, I think we all learned a lot from it. At least I know that I did. I didn't know much of the stuff that was going on with all of this, and it was really, really interesting. Um, so I want to invite you, so to invite you, of course. <laughs> I want <laughs> to invite you all to reflect on this session today with these three little questions that we have over here. So what brought you to this session today? What are three major takeaways you got from this presentation? And what do you want to learn? more about. You can answer these questions in, your mind, in the back of your mind. You can uh, write them down. And if you do make a writing of these questions, even though it is not required, um, I encourage you to submit it to our website for publication for recognition of your hard work and to enhance your future applications. I would like to mention once again that Pale Shadowing is launching a research program that will allow students to connect with principal investigators as they conduct research in a plethora of topics, fields, and locations. Once again, this program is 100% remote, which means we have the power to connect with anyone. And um, so for more information, you can fill out the interest form that was sent in the chat below, and we will get back to you as soon as possible with any additional details we may have. Um, furthermore, Pre-Health Shadowing is hosting a bingo board social media event for July, where you will be able to fill up a bingo board with each board having a specified dollar amount. To participate, all you need to do is post this on your social media platforms and get a group of friends to fill up the board for you. Um, again, the, you can find this board on our Instagram. So additionally, we have partnered with Krispy Kreme and with a donation of $10, you'll be able to receive a dozen donuts while also helping us here at PHS. More information can be also found in, um, by clicking the link that was sent in the chat or visiting our PHS website. Um, lastly, it is the perfect time to exercise outdoors with Free Health Shadowing's new Pledge Drive event. For this event, you will essentially be able to work out and help raise money for an excellent and healthy cause. For every $5 that I donated to you, you will be required to, uh, to exercise for one whole hour. So for more information, please do visit our website underneath the blog section. If you want to learn more about pre shadowing and how to get involved in our program, um, I encourage you all to visit our website. You can become any synchronous volunteer to get certified hours through professional nominations, graphic design, and social media promotion. And we are also accepting team member applications if you want to take on a more active role in PHS to lead projects, initiatives, and to be up here with us. Once again, we are humbly asking that if you are financially able to donate, that you please consider doing so. Um, it costs a lot to keep our program up and running and free to all of you. So if you're someone who can afford to, or if you know someone else who can, please support those who cannot by donating to our organization so everyone can continue to get the education they deserve. Otherwise, we simply ask you to spread the word about pre health shadowing to reach as many students as possible. Um, now for the part you have all been waiting for, that is earning a digital certificate for the virtual shadowing hours from this session today. So the first thing you're gonna, you're gonna do is go onto our website and find our professionals course pages. There you will um, be able to take our quick 10 question multiple choice quiz based on the content from the session today. You will have 30 minutes to earn a 70% or higher to get your certificate. We know that sometimes technology can be difficult and for this reason, we allow up to two attempts to take the assessment. So you will be able to take two assessments. 
each um, one consisting of 30 minutes. And you have um, two chances to, to earn a 70% or, or higher. So if you run into any other difficulties, please do not hesitate to contact us um, to ensure that our website does not crash from a high influx of students. We do recommend waiting about 30 minutes to an hour after this session today to take the quiz, which will be open and I want to highlight indefinitely. Um, finally, once you have passed, you can click the finish course button at the bottom of the professionals page. And there you will be able to download your certificate verifying your virtual shadowing hours. If you missed a part of this session and you want to go back or view other sessions to earn more certificates with ver um, verified virtual shadowing hours, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch our previous recordings. You can find them via the professionals pages on our website as well and take the post shadowing assessments for these. Um, be sure to follow us on social media or subscribe to our email list for the latest updates on upcoming sessions and events. Um, once again, thank you all for joining us today and please do stick around um, if you have any questions and myself and other team members will be happy to answer those. Um, this um, shuttering session is officially over and I invite you all to log off. Have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, night, depending on where you are.